We all aspire to have long and healthy lives, and we're living longer, certainly, but we're not necessarily healthy as we get older. Um, in order to improve our understanding of the challenges, we have to un understand genes and environment and how they interact. And by getting a deep understanding of that, we'll be able to get something towards the precision patient. Now, life has changed a lot in the last 100 years. There's been a change in the balance of power from infectious diseases to the disease of old age. So illustrated here for the lung, cancer's gone up, but also cardiovascular diseases. But there's a spectre of antibiotic resistance that's rising as well, which may reverse this situation in the next 20 years unless we don't do something about it. Genes, we all get a set of these cards to play in life, but how we play them is how we interact with our environment, our diet, our exercise regime, etc., etc. And all these things determine not only your likelihood of getting disease, but how you respond to therapies as well. Now, the other thing about this is that the world is connected by networks. And in fact, biology is connected by networks. This is a Facebook network, for instance, where networks of communication, networks of travel and transport, actually those networks can also facilitate transport of disease. So you can get from a disease from China to America in one day. But network theory also helps us understand gene environment interactions in really novel and interesting ways. So this is a, ne a network that connects all the genes that are known to be defective for a whole range of different diseases. There's all sorts of things, cardiovascular, brain diseases, etc. It's amazing you can put it all in one page. So this is giving us new insight in the way that biology works for humans and new insights into the way to develop therapies. But the, just because they're connections, doesn't mean to say that genes are the most important. In fact, environment probably outweighs uh, it genes significantly. America got fat in a relatively short time without their genes changing. And being obese unpins cancer risk, uh, diabetes risk, cardiovascular risk, and quadruples the chance of getting Alzheimer's disease in old age. Bad behavior starts in childhood. So this is a snapshot of British children. 50% don't get enough exercise. 30% 30% of children under the age of 16 get drunk once a week and 10% smoke. So we've got this tension between bad behaviors, which are increasing the burden of risk, and the uh, technology trying to develop to oppose those risks. If that wasn't complicated enough, we're not alone. Within us, there is a, a universe of microorganisms, about a kilogram on the average person, and during your lifetime, you put 20 tons of bacteria down the toilet, which is quite impressive. Now, those bugs actually interact physiologically with us all the time, and harnessing them is actually quite important because dysbiosis, which are disorders of our microorganisms, actually relate to a whole range of these modern diseases, from asthma to Alzheimer's disease to cardiovascular diseases. And also, our bugs fight off nasty bugs. So one of the potential salvations for the future is garnering our internal bugs to fight off pathogens. And it may be the only hope in the future. In order to measure all of this stuff, we need technology. And we've got a whole range of stuff, and it's very expensive. We've got blood chemistry, we've got imaging. It generates huge amounts of data. And one of the big challenges is actually efficiently using this data to guide us in patient care. So we have this ocean of information that has been generated that we need to understand. It's getting better or worse, depending on your point of view. We have all these new omics technologies for measuring genes, for measuring microbes, for measuring proteins, for measuring metabolites. If you sum that all up, it looks like about a petabyte of information. That's 16,000 iPads worth, if you like, per person. And we have to capture that information, model it, and use it for doctors. There are some areas where the technology is immediately appropriate for the precision patient. This is part of the eye knife developed by Aradazi, myself, uh, and Jolton Takats at Imperial, where the smoke of the, the surgeon's knife is used chemically to diagnose on a second-to-second -second basis the tissue chemistry and give you a decision as to cut or not to cut. Overall, there's a multimodal data stream, all sorts of stuff that's coming in that the doctor has to make sense of. And part of the challenge is handling the data and melding it together mathematically to produce individualized or precision models of the patient. And the biggest challenge of that is visualization. The data has to be in a way a doctor can understand it. So we work in what we call stratified medicine engines or navigation engines or strat navs, okay? Uh, strat, uh, strat meds. Uh, and we can adapt these to take in the data and produce a new version of the patient journey that the doctor can interact with. And ultimately, you can use this for training and potentially you can use it for the, the, the uh, patient as well. There's a big tension in all of this between developed and developing world. Most of the spend goes on in the developed world. 
most of the population rise, and in fact the need is in the developing world. So there is a tension and science should serve all mankind. So we need to think of new ways of getting the technology over to uh, the general population, at the same time balancing off those bad behaviours with our technological development. So that leads me finally to the question posed to you, which is how do we take advantage of scientific innovation and te technology development in the most efficient way to and overcome the financial, cultural and educational barriers to translation for efficient patient care? Thank you.